there we go. So, chapter 5, we're getting into some, some actual material now. Chapter 5 is on superposition, stability, and other linear time invariant system properties, LTI properties. So, uh, we have a little like intro to the chapter in this case. This is like, this is like lecture zero, I guess. Um, if, ah, oh, thank you. If you've got, uh, if you don't have this page, I just handed it out, so it should be somewhere. Oh, okay. Well, distribute the, oh, there's a one pager that's going around, so hopefully. <laughs> it stopped with Robert. Jeez. Jeez. What are we going to do with you? Okay, so in this chapter, we will extend our understanding of linear time invariant or LTI system properties. Well, we must keep in mind a few important definitions. But before we begin, let's think about what we've got so far. So we're, we're starting out this course uh, with the idea that we know how to model at least some systems. We know how to write down differential equations that describe at least some systems. And the different forms that we have at this point are input-output differential equations, I.O. differential equations, which we can solve using our method of undetermined coefficients, for instance. Um, we have state-space models, which we don't know how to solve yet, but we know are very powerful, and we're going to learn how to solve them in a couple weeks. And then uh, we also have uh, uh, transfer functions that we used to go in between those two. So those are the three representations that we've introduced so far. Assuming you have that, there are some properties of systems that can be learned from these differential equations and their solutions. And so we're going to investigate some of those. And we're going to be interested in those system properties for uh, reasons of, of design. So we might be interested in having a certain performance based on uh, a property of the system, some sort of, um, so one of the properties we'll talk about is stability, like we want the systems that we design to be stable, usually, um, and, well, not all, always, but usually, and uh, we also are going to be interested uh, to, to use some of these principles to understand um, how to characterize what a system is doing and, and, and how it's going to perform. And I would say one additional thing that we're going to do along the way, and it's good not to get too focused on this, but it's easy to because it helps you solve problems, and that is that there are some sort of uh, uh, convenient solution tools that come up th through these properties. So that's what uh, we'll be using uh, some of these properties to do. like build tables of solutions that we can use using the prop if we if we uh, also consider the properties that we're, we'll introduce in this chapter so uh, I'll introduce some of these properties in the first couple lectures so today and then uh, on Friday we will do an example uh, a, a sort of extended in-depth example where we're gonna sort of demonstrate a bunch of these properties and their use so Okay, so that's kind of the plan. So let's go through a couple of these definitions uh, before we begin. So the transient response of a system is its response during the initial time interval uh, during which the initial conditions dominate. Okay, so we had this definition last semester. We talked about it in the electronics text. Um, the steady state response we also talked about. Uh, of a system is its remaining response, uh, which occurs after the transient is done. So figure 5.1 illustrates these definitions. So we've got this response. Uh, I actually yanked this right from the electronics notes. So this is, uh, I don't remember if it was like a current or something through an inductor, something like that. Uh, and we started it out as some initial condition of 10 amps maybe, or I'm not sure what the unit was. If it was current, it would have been amps. Um, and we also had a forcing function, an input to the system that was sinusoidal, okay? So what happens to the system is there's some period during which the initial condition affects 
what the solution looks like, what the response looks like. And then after some period of time, it pretty much has settled down into this steady sinusoid. Okay. So we've got uh, uh, this initial region uh, or, or interval, really, this is a time interval, that we call uh, uh, the transient response. Okay. So during that interval, the response is called the transient response. During the later interval, from then onward, we call the response the steady state response. So it's the response, de it's defined as just the response after the transient is uh, uh, negligible in your solution. So we are, uh, we are looking at this transition here as being, I, I put it sort of at this, you know, uh, dividing line there, there's a sort of sharp cutoff, but there mm -hmm. is no sharp cutoff uh, between the transient response and the steady state response. The transient response uh, will manifest through decaying exponentials, typically, and decaying exponentials never actually get to zero, right? They just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So they do have an effect out here, but their effect is sort of diminishingly small compared to the other response. So that's what we um, consider to be the transient, is when the, the initial conditions are affecting the, the response significantly. Okay, and so this usually happens um, on a scale of about five to six time constants. So we, we usually have a transition from the transient response to the steady state response around five to six time constants. And that's great if you have a first order system, right? Because it has a time constant associated with it. But higher order systems don't necessarily have, well, they don't have a single time constant at least, but we've talked about how sometimes higher order systems can be thought of as having multiple time constants. One of those time constants will be the slowest one. Whatever the largest time constant is, it'll be the slowest one. And the other time constant's effects will be gone before that, that slowest time constant. So we, we usually call the, the largest time constant the dominant time constant. So that dominant time constant, uh, uh, or if it's a first order system, the time constant, tau, is shown here. So in one time constant, we're still very much in transient. Two, three, four, it's getting pretty close to being steady. Uh, uh, five, you're, you're within, I think it's like 2% or something at five time constants, maybe 1%. Um, at six time constants, it's some fraction of 1% uh, uh, of, the, of the response is left, of the initial condition effects are left. So you're uh, usually safe if you wait five to six dominant time constants, um, your system will be in steady state at that point. Yes? So the largest number of time constants, so longest time yeah. the dominant So like tau equals two seconds might be one of them, so tau one. You have another time constant that's like 25 seconds. This is the one that will be the dominant one. Okay, uh, great. So we've seen these before, and I think that we uh, are pretty comfortable with them. But we're about to introduce some related concepts that are subtly different, and uh, they get confused a lot. So I wanted to bring back those definitions first, remember them, and then, uh, then introduce the new ones. So the free response of a system is defined as the response of the system to initial conditions without forcing. In other words, to be really specific in the definition, um, the specific solution of the input-output ODE with the forcing function identically zero. Remember that our input-output differential equations are of the form something y double dot plus, using dot as being a time derivative, plus something y dot plus something y, this would be a second order system, equals some forcing function f of t, right? So the free response is when we set f of t equal to zero. 
but we have non-zero initial conditions. And uh, that is the definition of the free response. So an example of that would be if you have a mass hanging from a spring and you were to stretch that and then when you start the, the clock you let go of the mass and you let the uh, so you, you had some equilibrium value, you stretched it away from the equilibrium value and you let it go, you would have some response of the mass and it would go to uh, uh, its equilibrium value over time. It would oscillate and then damp down to eventually being at equilibrium again. So that would be the free response. Um, this is closely related to but distinct from the transient response. Okay, so the transient response is the free response plus an additional term. So the transient in here um, is, is related to the free response, but remember that the transient also has this other term in there, and that's the, what's called the forced response. So this additional term is the forced response, the response of the system to a forcing function without initial conditions. So in other words, f of t is not zero now. It's whatever the forcing function is. In this example, it would be a sinusoid. Uh, but we set the initial conditions to be zero for the forced response. So it's just taking into account what the forcing does and not into account what the initial conditions do to the solution. Um, so to be very specific in our, our definition, um, the forced response is the specific solution of the input-output ODE with the initial conditions identically zero. Okay. So in, one, so in the free response, you set the forcing to zero, and you found what the specific solution was for that. With the uh, uh, forced response, you set the initial conditions to zero, and you found out what the response was from forcing alone. Okay? So those are the two definitions there, and we're going to use those in just a moment when we introduce superposition in the next lecture. So, Are there any questions on those definitions or anything else? Yeah. So oh, you're setting the initial condition to zero, but you're not setting, you're still keeping the, the however many order equations, right? Correct. So uh, say this was our equation. So this is the first thing that we have, our equation. The second thing we have are our initial conditions, like y of zero equals uh, five, and y dot of zero equals three. If those are our initial conditions and this is our uh, uh, differential equation, in the first one, in the um, free response, we set f of t equal to zero and we leave the initial conditions alone. In the forced response, we set the initial conditions to zero, so we would we'd set these to zero, and we would use the forcing function. So it's like you can do this problem and you're starting to see what we're doing. We're kind of taking pieces of the problem and solving them separately, right? So the free response separately from the forced response. Previously, we had looked at that as being all part of one problem, right? The solution was whatever the solution was. We had the homogeneous plus the particular solution. We added them together. That was what I said plus for. And then we applied the initial conditions and we got our solution, right? That was the solution technique that we used. And now we're doing it a little bit differently. We're saying you could do a free response solution, you could do a forced response solution. And in a moment, we're going to tie those together and construct the, uh, the specific solutions or general solutions from the free and forced responses. So more on that in just a moment.